into this, this uh, body, that brain is wired in multiple different ways depending upon nature and nurture. Okay? Because genes are turned on or off. And the brain is an amazing organ. How many neurons do you think that you have in your brain? How many billion? 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 <laughs> that you used to have. Yeah, well, they're still there. Um, all of you have 86 billion neurons. And all of these are just interconnected. <laughs> and your computer runs so fast, it runs like 74 gigabytes. That is massive storage. Think about your own computers on your laptops and such. With the amount of information that you assimilate during the day is the same amount as watching 16 movies. That's how powerful you are if you keep your brain up. So the brain is very, very worthwhile and extremely important to keep your brain functioning. Right? Because without that, you really can't move an arm, move a leg, express a thought, express what's in your heart. And so it's incredibly important to keep our brain sharp. So how do we, what's now called super age, which is really protecting our brain. How, how do those people who are 80, 90, whatever, and yet they're cognitively sharp as a tack, how do they do it? Well, again, it's nature and nurture, but you have control over that. So, let me ask you a quick question. Your body is composed of what percent water? 75 percent. Good job. And what is the most water-containing organ? You can only guess. The brain. Okay. So what happens if you become dehydrated? Your synapses don't fire, they don't connect well. Okay? And so it's incredibly important to drink at least two liters of water a day because then that hydrates the brain and the brain can fire fast. All right? Who has, who, who's had um, a heat stroke or, or a heat exhaustion? What happened to your brain when that happened? I don't remember. <laughs> <laughs> she said she doesn't remember. <laughs> <laughs> but, but just think about what happens to your brain at the end of the day when you haven't had water or maybe you skipped a bunch of meals. So what does the brain, how does the brain get its energy? Glucose. Glucose activity, yes, but you have to have circulation. You're absolutely right, because if people don't, if they're just sitting and their circulatory rate is not the same as if you're actively pumping blood and oxygen to the brain with movement, it doesn't have to be exercise, but it needs to be movement, okay? So having said that, sodas and liquids. Actually, sodas are not good for you. And particularly the diet sodas. They did the you know, aspartame and those type of chemicals cause a lot of inflammation in the body and actually can worsen cognitive function. They can increase insulin levels, which then are inflammatory to the body. So I don't drink sodas. I don't this stuff. Um, but, you know, it's the 80-20 rule, right? 80% of the time you have good health practice, 20% of the time your body usually forgives you. <laughs> you know? But, um, so if you just gotta have a soda, have one, but just make it an occasional treat or something like that. So, the major substrate for energy besides oxygen and, and blood is glucose. So what happens if you have poor nutrition? 
That's right. Yeah, everything doesn't do well. That's for sure. If you have poor nutrition, there's it's really it's actually been documented that there's a place in the brain called the hippocampus, and that is for memory and learning and storage of memories. And guess what happens to the hippocampus if you eat a really poor, highly processed diet? <coughs> Meaning not enough fruits, not enough vegetables, not enough whole foods. What happens to the hippocampus? They actually did a that's exactly right, it shrinks. They did a study in New Zealand looking at healthy 20 year olds and they did scans of their brain and they looked at the size of the hippocampus and then they let them eat fast food three times a day for seven days and re scan them and there was a neural dropout. A neural dropout in the hippocampus. And these were 20 year olds. So, a lifetime of good nutrition and such is imperative. You can actually make a difference for yourself now with good nutrition. Okay, because they took those same students that had the shrinkage in the hippocampal area, put them back on good diet and exercise, and the hippocampus plumped up. And you look, whoa, this is an amazing thing. Can we really regenerate neurons? You can. That's exactly right. And that's what I want to talk to you about today. So I gave you this handout. And if you look at that, the topic is called neuroplasticity. That's the fancy medical term for can you regenerate your own neurons. And what you see on this page is that you do have the ability to change the structure of the function intentionally, intentionally. So if you right now in this room decide that you're gonna have a better brain, you will have a better brain if you follow the tenets of the six pillars that we're teaching you. And you'll notice an improvement over time in memory, attention, focus, executive function. Those are all the domains of cognitive function in the brain, as well as calculation and spatial perception. So this falls for us in this age group. So absolutely that if you have willful activity, you can reshape your brain. So sleep is incredibly important. We're going to get to the second side of this in a minute. So we talked about the brain having all these neurons that connect and pass information all over the brain. It's, it just scintillates. It's, it's constant chatter in the brain. We experience that. If we don't learn to teach our brain how to focus, all we hear is brain chatter and same old stuff going round and 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 round. Okay, you can stop it. You can't. If you choose to focus on something else, all of a sudden, those neurons which were firing down that same old track, same old track, same old track, and recruiting more neurons to deepen that habit, let's say a negative thought or negative health practice. But let's just say I elect to change that. What happens? Guess what? I start making a new neural pathway and I start recruiting neurons, my brain actually goes and prunes off the connections for those older neurons, those older pathways. It prunes them off and then now reestablishes a brand new connection. And so the more I do it, the more I repeat it, the deeper it gets and now it's a good health habit, okay? So the other, so that I think that's important to know. So when you're saying, oh, I can't get rid of this, or oh, I can't stop that thought, uh, yeah, you can. You just say, well, yeah, well, what would you say? Stop it. You could say, cancel. I'm done with that. That's an old tape running. <coughs> and it is. So just by interrupting that pathway, now you have an opportunity 
to create a new healthy pathway, a new way of being, a new function in your brain. And this has to do with learning, too. How many people have learned something new in the last year? Ooh, impressive. Impressive. Because that type of creativity and challenge is imperative. That's the thing that makes the new connections. That's the thing that disrupts the old way of storing information, is that being curious learning something new, that, that really, really, really enriches the brain. The other thing that's imperative is sleep. And I don't mean just eight hours. Some people need nine or 10 hours because as we age, we don't get into enough deep sleep. We might get REM where we're dreaming and processing feelings and thoughts and emotions. But that deep sleep is the one where the brain actually does its own housekeeping. Did you know that? It's fascinating. So if you don't have enough water before you go to bed at night, you're not going to really flush out the cells as readily with all the metabolic waste products. You want those, you want those cells to dump all the metabolic waste products so they don't make big lumps called cow protein, which is called Alzheimer's. Okay? So we want to flush the brain out. And there's a whole network underneath the neurons called the microglial cells. And its job is the house plate. You're the house plate routine of the brain. Not only that, they regulate inflammation. So if you are really aware if you listen and start thinking, feeling this and putting this into practice, your brain will function better because these microglial system will start removing all the toxic waste products and then excreting them into the urine, the blood of the urine, okay? And so getting deep, restful sleep is incredibly important. And if you're not, go talk to your doctor or your health provider and find out why you're not getting good sleep. And in this age group, we do not want to take benzodiazepine, Xanax, Clonopin, that type of thing. It's not good for you. And it's not good for your cognitive function. And again, another one. You want to find better ways of falling asleep, making sure your body is rest, rested and relaxed, before we go to sleep, make sure your mind is quiet. Yes? What about melatonin? Melatonin, that's a great question. She asked, what about melatonin? That's not a problem. Melatonin is actually made by the pineal gland, or pineal gland, which is right back by the, behind the pituitary. And it is in all vertebrate animals. How do they wake up? is the decrease in melatonin. And then when the melatonin, when the darkness comes, the melatonin increases and induces sleep. So, I mean, this goes for the animal world as well as us. So, guess what happens when we pull out our laptops and our, I have a TV in the room? What happens to melatonin? Yeah, you don't get the melatonin increase that you need to Happen to precipitate sleep. What else precipitates sleep at night? A cold? Yeah. Uh, I just had a previous statement. Is that some school night lights? Because I noticed I do not get the night light off. Okay, so she's saying that if she has bright light in her room, absolutely, that will go through the retina of the pupil to the retina and then stimulate a decrease in the, in the melatonin production. Great question. So yes, a soft light, um, if your mind is whirling at night, go ahead and write out all your concerns and say, I'll handle it tomorrow. Because you know what, your, your thoughts rarely leave you alone, <laughs> do they? 
because they keep coming back. You say, look, I got it. It's on paper. I'll, I'll worry about this tomorrow. And then go do something different with your mind. You can listen to music. You can, there's a, a lot of programs called Inducing Theta, Theta Brain Waves, and Theta Brain Waves make you sleep. It's like deep meditation or deep prayer. If you meditate or pray at night, that's also incredibly helpful. If you take, if you quit thinking about the fact that you can go thinking and you start feeling your body like your big toe. How many people ever feel their big toe? But if you put all your consciousness there, it works. Just feel your feet. Just feel, feel, feel your feet. And then the brain goes, uh, okay. All right. <laughs> All right, good. Mm, I'm feeling that it disrupts that. Woo! My thoughts. Okay? So, what I wanted to show you on this, and take this home and really think about it if you have positive neuroplasticity, if you're taking care of your brain with the pillars of health, look at the amount of synapses or connections in the brain. It's, it's huge. If you have poor health habits, look at what happens to the brain. Look at how many synapses there are to fire and how slow you become. So what I'd like you to do now is to go and circle whether you have positive or negative neuroplasticity. You don't have to show it to your neighbor, but I want you to sense yourself right now because it's a beautiful way of saying, I can do something different. Yes? Okay, thank you very much. Cognitive remediation therapy means like going to uh, getting computer programs like Brain Gym. Um, you can also do crossword puzzles and those type of things to make your brain think differently and have to extract that and make new connections. So that was a great question. Uh, but here's the interesting thing. If you work crossword puzzles all the time, that's not as stimulating as now changing to Sudoku. So anything that challenges your brain and makes it rearrange, that's where the growth is. Yes, sir. Mention the importance of glucose for your brain. Now, how do we take get good glucose out of sugars? Right? We get sugars out of soda and all of that. How do we determine what? I what love you your question. Let me let me rephrase that so everybody here can really on. So, how do you get glucose out of sugar? How do you get just what the brain needs out of food? So what you want to do is to have what we call a low glycemic diet. You don't want to be drinking straight sugars and honey and that kind of thing because that increases the insulin levels which then turn on inflammation which then causes neurologic inflammation, okay? Even some people who have COVID got neural inflammation. So if you have generalized inflammation in your body where you're targeted, that you have genetically, that can be a problem. But let me answer your question a little bit better. So if you don't eat, or better yet, if you're going to eat sugars, eat it with a mixed meal, fat and protein, because that delays the absorption. The higher the fiber, the better you handle the breakdown of the food. So food is carbohydrates, protein, and fat. Carbohydrates is what people call sugar, but it's more than that, okay? And so what you want to do is only have just a small amount of energy dispensed pretty much throughout the day that you can utilize rather than one big lump of energy and then nothing, all right? That's why, does anybody remember when you're a student or maybe you're a student now? how you study, 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 all of a sudden you got hungry as hell. Remember that? That's because you used up all the glucose in your brain. Now you're into the fat, the butyrates. 
Um, so what you want to do is actually learn to have carbohydrates in the form of non-processed food. You want to eat whole foods. Okay, steam your vegetables so they're not mush. Because remember, the fiber is the thing that really, really helps, and plus all the B vitamins, et cetera, which is also very, very good for the brain, the folate, and all that kind of stuff, and the fruits. Okay? So what you want to do is to have lots of nuts. They have fiber. They have omega-3s, which are good for the brain. And so if you have a handful or two of nuts, or you graze on nuts, uh, and, and fruit, then you're doing your brain a real service. Okay, that was a great, great question. But I can talk to you in detail about it, and I can get you a low glycemic index diet. These are the foods that don't raise your blood sugar inordinately, and that these are the foods that are like super helpful for your body. So that was a great question. Yes? Uh, you said water is necessary to avoid sugars and sugars. What other than water? Would like iced tea? Because it has a lot of water. Yeah, I mean, we have to it. So uh, that's a great question. Thanks, Tom. So Tom wants to know what can you do besides just water? And I go, yeah, water. But you can also make water appealing, I would say. I mean, I cut up uh, fruit in mine, particularly lemons, slimes, cucumbers. You can stuff mint in it. You can stuff basil in it. You can make your water flavor. Yeah, the tangerines. We're blessed with tons of fruit here on the island. But back to your question, teas are fine, coffee is fine. Yeah, so, you know, again, every, everything in moderation, right? But, uh, co but coffee and tea are also fine. There's a lot of anti-inflammatory properties in coffee and tea, particularly green tea. Okay, for those of you who ever had uh, brushes with cancer, green tea is, is really a great choice. So, okay, let me turn it over to, back to Carl. I think I've uh, exhausted my time here. <laughs>